So imagine we're all going to board a Dreamliner. First class tickets, it's a big plane. Everybody in this room, we're all going. <laughs> we're gonna to travel to the world's greatest petroleum basins. When we arrive, we're gonna be greeted by local experts who know these basins better than anybody. And we're gonna have the opportunity as geoscientists to share our thoughts. That's how we do these super basin thinking programs over the last five years. And I wanna share with you today the lessons that we've learned from these programs. And on this jetliner, we have a special Wi-Fi internet connection to APG data pages. So not only can we travel the globe, but we can travel back in time to the great minds of those who have come before us. Speaking of which, why do we hold Halbuti lectures anyway? <laughs> Welcome, by the way, to the 2021 Halbuti lecture. I did a study and I looked up all the Sydney Powers medalists on APG data pages and I read their papers. And what's remarkable, they have lessons for all of us today. I wanted to power up with the Powers medalists. And what I learned is each have a message, sometimes two messages, but usually one main message. Leverson's all about stratigraphic traps. Bert Bally's all about big regional structural thinking. But Mike Halbooty had many things, whereas a lot of the powers medalists had a thing. Halbooty had giant fields, salt domes, stratigraphic traps, of our heritage, remote sensing, and an amazing thing called maximum brain power, which is really all about integration. How appropriate, by the way, for an SEG APG joint meeting at here at Image. Now, before I get too far, I love this photo of Mike and I taken 21 years ago, but we have a special guest here today that I think has a strong resemblance to the fellow on the right. Would you please stand up? Uh, grandson of Mike Albuty and just wave to the audience. We're glad you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Hewitt Halbuti came to be to support this program and to support this effort. And please join me at the end of this lecture if you'd like to come up and, and say some words uh, to him. Integration. It's all about integration. And that was maximum brain power. And you see that at the A&M campus. So today we're starting the third decade of Halbuti Lectures. And one of the things I was most fortunate, I became good friends with Mike Halbuti, was that for the first four Halbuti Lectures, we would sit together. He only was alive for the first four. He uh, sought me out and we would sit and he'd tell me what he liked and he'd tell me what he didn't like about it each and every one. So what do you think was important to Mike? Maps and cross sections, my friends. He wanted lots, he wanted his Halbuti lectures to show people a lot of geological images and a toolkit, things they could use to find oil and gas. So Mike, I know you're up there. I got plenty of maps and cross sections for you. <laughs> Stay tuned, everybody. Here are a few phrases I'd like you to just pause on as we think about our past and our future. And courage. This is a message from Mike Halbuti from 50 years ago. And I think courage lives today. I love the courage of Alex Epstein, who is walking upstream on an anti-fossil fuel protest wearing an I love fossil fuels t-shirt and look at the look on the face of this guy over here he's like this guy's gonna get creamed but alex is a great um philosopher and he has a message for all of us the importance of reframing how energy brings good things to humanity and i encourage you to take a look at his industrialprogress.com webpage. so here's a question where were you on the night 
of Monday, April 7th, 1997. I feel like I'm Columbo here. I can tell you exactly where I was. <laughs> I was in the front row at the uh, Dallas Convention Center, ballroom C1, C2, attending the H APG Legendary Tale event, organized, by the way, by dear friend Jim Gibbs. Jim, <laughs> you did it, buddy. And in that panel, I took many pages of notes, but I highlight here, uh, Mike Albury had a message that wild canning can be very heartbreaking, but my credo is don't quit. I've, yeah, that's comforted me on many occasions. Also, last year's Albury uh, lecturer was in that panel, Bernard Duval. And I wanna say here that this event triggered for me, I guess a lifetime of service. Um, for the better 24 years, I have been volunteering for programs probably on the average of 20 hours a week doing technical content uh, probably a little more time when I was APG president but for me it's, it's all about service so I want to say a word about mentors and how that works because it leads to the my connection with Mike Albert so what I would say young professionals if young professional as I was on this day in 1997 and you want to get some Tours. The way to do it, or at least the way that worked for me, is I approached Mike Albert, and over the years, I offered service. I didn't ask about what it was in it for me. I asked about what I could do. It's kind of like right out of JFK. Ask what you can do for your country, but what your country, I got that backwards. That's not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for and so we focused on programs that our Mike was passionate about, and then our relationship grew. And I've got some stories, but <laughs> we'll keep that for another day. But think about that, young professionals. So this in 1997 started the ball rolling for me. And for me, my personal journey has been a journey of scaling from that night in Dallas. To, to I then went and organized programs for my local geological society. And in each of the programs, you'll note on the left, is a legacy. I worked very hard to not only pack the house, make money for the host organization, but to leave a resource, a legacy of resources, either on the web or in videos or in publications. We kicked off Discovery Thinking. We just had a Discovery Thinking forum this afternoon. We're going to have another one tomorrow. And to combine with the uh, ACE and ICE, the international and the um, US based conferences, I think we've got about estimate over 12,000 attendees over the years. So we're really proud of those uh, individuals for supporting this program. And then we looked at plays. So we're thinking on bigger and bigger scales. And here's what we're going to talk about today is super basins and what have we learned from them in these recent years. And there's a few things that are happening that are coming out of continued work, uh, giant fields and how um, these work. And so what we're really looking at is various aspects of the exploration process. And I'd like to recognize my colleague Alexei Milkov. This is a diagram you can see that has basins, plays, leads, prospects, drill ready prospects. So all of the informed drilling decisions that happen are part of a context, a big context. And a lot of things we may do on a daily basis are one or two of these things. But I think the lesson here is to be effective as the most successful explorers are, is to continually link at various scales and to see all parts of the process. When I was an undergraduate at Columbia University, there was a phrase that stuck with me and it stuck with me good. The best geologist has seen the most rocks. And so that drove my thinking to attend as many field trips as I could attend, to take as many geology classes as I could. I, I think I maxed out all the classes. I got every degree I ever got at a university was in geology because why would I want to 
dilute my working interest in something that I really wanted to know. And that is the reason why we study the super basins, the neural connectivity of what we learn from one place can be valuable to create insights for other places. And so what a great journey it's been these last five years. I want to thank all of the supporters and the attenders. You may see yourself in these photos. They're happy people learning about the world's greatest petroleum base. And a special thank you to Bob Frickland and Pete Stark. Their initial work in 2016 with Leader Smith on defining what a super basin is and some of the commercial aspects really took was thought great thought leadership and took the industry by storm. And as I was thinking, what would be my theme for my AAPG presidency? I thought, you know, going back to where the hydrocarbons are just plain makes good sense for an organization called the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. <laughs> so let's go, let's go to these great basins. The things that have happened lately that are the most significant are the onshore basins have undergone revitalization with horizontal drilling, that we know. And the offshore basins are being revitalized by enhanced seismic imaging. So we're gonna talk about these things a little more in greater detail. And what we did in 2018, we started an AAPG Super Basin Initiative, which was to foster the science behind the world's greatest petroleum basins, because after all, who else is gonna do it? We're the AAPG. We need to have the, the geology and the geoscience that makes these basins come alive and helps with the uh, global renaissance of coming back to the world's greatest basins. And so I'm delighted to give a shout out here to uh, Dr. Claudio Bordellini, my colleague. We are, uh, and also to APG's editor, Bob Merrill. We are in the process of delivering special issues for the APG Bulletin. Take a look. Uh, the greatest basins were on a campaign to get as many uh, of the world's greatest basins written up and here they are. The ones circled in red are basins that are either already published or are in manuscript review. And we have some that are in preparation for future special issues. And if you see a basin that you think needs to have a paper for this, this collection, come see Claudio or myself. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. So back to my Calvary and an exploration toolkit. Let's do something. It's the old US News and World Report. News you can use. What can we learn from these efforts on super basins that make us all more effective energy, more effective and creative energy geoscientists? So let's focus on seven things today. You can see what they are. We're gonna begin with technology and we're gonna end with creative thinking. And just to note, there's the reference here and I'll give it again at the end. If you wanna see any of this stuff in greater detail, it's all written up in my December APG bulletin paper, December, 2020. So what is really the driver that revitalizes super base? And of course it's technology. Now, yes, I know I've shown this slide before. Some of you may remember it from my APG president address a few years back. Imagine standing here at 2007 and trying to predict the future. And of course, you know, the, if you just have a ruler, you might go out like this. And we're, we all know there's a big surprise about to happen. But imagine just, let's remember standing there or remember when George Mitchell was standing here in 1998 and he, uh, unconventionals hadn't taken off yet. The courage, personal courage and fortitude to continue to, to continue to perfect so what I want to talk about is we know that there's a new golden age, but what I want to talk about is where do we go from here? <laughs> so let's just take a moment. The thing I want to point about, even though I've shown the slide before, the thing I wanted to focus that's a little bit new is when we only knew this, this is what we used to call peak oil. That was our vision of reality. And now we have a new revitalized vision of reality. So what's 
what's a, a workable vision of reality going forward? Well, as an optimist, which I believe explorationists need to be, I would say that we are only working on a small part of the uh, recovery efficiency of an entire petroleum resource base. So back in golden age one, we had a limited vision and we only were maybe going to get 10 or 15 percent of the petroleum base. But then we had a new golden age and another increment gets added. And what I would offer is I think we're going to see continued waves of revitalization as we get more and more closer to a more full and complete recovery efficiency of the global petroleum habitats. And this is just to show the same thing happening in the offshore. So it doesn't matter whether there is water or non water. It's these are things that are driven by technology. And I want to point out that this in this graph that Bob Merrill and I used in our 2017 paper, the uh, APG century and how technology has uh, driven innovation is the price of oil is uh, shaded in green on the background. And what is key here is these branches of various technologies seem to proliferate when they have to, when prices are tough. And we've just come out of one of those. But that is, we are at our best when we need to be. And that is a hallmark of geoscientists. Geoscientists also are the integrators in chief. I think it's wonderful that we can be helpful to with engineering uh, concepts. So in the onshore, the name of the game, as we all know, is horizontal drilling with various uh, various links, uh, stages of uh, increased stages of fracking, num more fracks, stronger fracks, different fluids. It's just a continued perfection stacking over the horizontals. So this is just an optimization of a combination of, of uh, things. The other thing is engineering in the offshore, all of the different things that now make geoscience uh, and our com combined efforts possible in other environments. And we'll talk about some other geophysical examples here that are game changers. And I do believe that geochemistry deserves a significant shout out. And to emphasize the point, and I've shown this before, geology and engineering, the combination is it's the foundation. So what drove the technology is the geology. So here in the in Midland Basin, uh, on the east side of the Central Basin uplift, you can see that vertical wells work great in porous rock. But as the rock got more distal, and you can see the core photos getting tighter and more shallier, what was required of the engineering to do this was horizontal drilling. And so that is the linkage. It all comes back to the rocks, as it does in the offshore. And as we compare some of the great advancements in subsalt and pre-salt imaging in both provinces, this is the key. So let's have a little fun. Let's do some time lapse. This is a prospect that turned into a major discovery uh, in the offshore Gulf of Mexico. And it doesn't matter the name of the discovery, but I do want to thank John Paul Van Gestel and BP and BHP for these slides. So this is a big high. This is subsalt. There is a big high on our imaging. This is at the uh, pre-drill stage. Looks great. It's a big high under the salt. Let's drill it. <laughs> and as we make the discovery, the imaging is getting a little better. And as we drill a few appraisal wells, we're combining well information, we're getting better seismic and more wells, more se seismic improvement, and it continues and continues and the, the imaging and the details just keep getting better. The simile, let's look at this uh, from profile view, maps and cross sections, remember what Mike said, this is what it looked like, a big high, once again, you know, Looks encouraging, we might have something here, but look at how we can better image the salting uh, under the salt 
look at how we better image the layers of the reservoirs on the high and look how we can better image internal um, compartments. The lesson here, dear friends, is that as we try to predict the future, we always use the vision that we have today because that's all we have. But the reality is technology is dynamic. It keeps getting better. So we have to factor in that as time progresses, things are not staying the same, but we're getting better. And it's the same when we talk about space exploration. When JFK said uh, we're going to put a man and safely return him on the moon, uh, he the technology didn't exist, but his op fortitude and vision predicted that we would create on the fly as needed the things that it would take. So super basins have super data. These are very mature basins with a lot of wells in them. And so here's some work from a good uh, colleague of mine, uh, Bill Fairhurst. Many of you know him for his work at the uh, uh, TOR at the Bureau of Economic Geology. And Bill's got a point that I think we all need to, to hear is that 80% of the work of good data analytics comes from entering the right geologic data, entering it properly, and making sure that we're adding good data. You cannot put in bad data and work it with algorithms to get a good result. The old saying, garbage in, garbage out. You have to come back to good foundational geology and you have to make sure you have good data. So Bob Shoup, colleague, another key point here, data points are still the same, but our concepts, our geological concepts drive which one of the interpretations we go with. And that is an experiential thing. So let's talk about item two in the uh, toolkit, super basin source rocks. So these, we, we've seen these great uh, graphs of the layers and the key times. But what I want to point out is that all of these super basins have one or more major petroleum systems. Um, they also have hidden systems that geochemistry is helping us hear their whispers. And so, there's a lot of new petroleum systems back in these existing super basins. And what I would like to suggest is that you take a look at what we have in our next super basin issue for the bullet uh, that'll be out in 2022, December 2022, our, our fourth one paper by Russ Okabe. So let's talk about the continuum of oil habitats. So what we've come to appreciate that the source rock used to be uh, just source, but now it's actually somewhat of a source and reservoir. And the pathways that the hydrocarbons migrate into the migrated plays. Start, let's think like oil and follow the oil drops. So we start in the source rocks and what we've learned Thickness is very important in a lot of these North American plays. And we also know the distribution, the architecture of stratigraphic layering has a pact. So there's, I'd like to thank Irene Irango for her work on this. So you can have highly interbedded source, you can have a sandwich source, um, reservoir between source, or uh, uh, just a big thick source. So as we migrate out, oh, and by the way, and there, there are landing zone implications um, based on the architecture. As we migrate out, there's been a lot of work uh, in the pathways and using the new tools. There's a wonderful new special issue, the Bulletin, Breyer and Usen uh, in the September um, APG Bulletin. And Dick Stoneburner has outlined some of these um, areas where carrier bed plays may be highly perspective. 
and uh, take a look at their documented in my own uh, Super Basin thinking paper. So the petroleum systems folio sheet for hypothetical migrated place. Congratulations, Les Magoon, on getting the Powers Medal this year. And thank you for using both maps and cross sections and timing charts to help detail individual petroleum systems. I believe this is the kind of work that needs to happen in all of the super basins and it needs to be continually updated. And as we look at where the oil reaches in migrated traps, the we want to also recognize that their late tilt can create hydrodynamic traps. And what we have learned, and I wanted to thank uh, Bob Trentum and Steve Meltzer, is we now are cataloging them and finding that they're more abundant than we ever thought in the world's greatest basins. So as we talk about the reservoir, something here I think that's interesting is that we need to think in two ways about a reservoir, two big ways. The first is the source to sink. And successful explorers that I have seen understand the pathways. And they also understand the concentrations of how the vertical and lateral nature, the commerciality of these resources. So a, a shout out to uh, uh, Henry Pettingill and Paul Weimer for their pioneering work here on what makes a great deep water field. And the essence is, here's a, a small area, but a tall vertical column. Here's a large area, but a small vertical column. And the economics are far superior for the ability to access the resources in uh, the concentrated version. So as Marlon Downey would say, sometimes when, when you're talking about giant fields, you just take what you get. Sometimes you just have to take what you get. <laughs> but from a commerciality standpoint, which drives everything we do, it's important to be mindful of how this fits together with economics. The other big thing about reservoir, and this is very important in unconventional place, but conventional too, is the many manifestations of wonderful, glorious cliniforms, the repeated motifs in all these different basins. And sometimes it's the bottom sets and, and landing zones that are associated with the bottom sets in like those examples in Williston or the, this beautiful seismogenic play of cliniforms in Argentina. Or perhaps it's the four sets themselves that are sealed by the top sets in Oklahoma. Or it's a system where, like in Russia, where it all works. Uh, on top of the glorious Bajanov source rock, the bottom sets, the four sets, and the top sets, they all work. And some really great examples of top sets in Kansas and Oklahoma. Thank you, uh, Lupo and, and Kristinik. And, uh, and then of course, in North Alaska Super Basin, uh, when the Brookian play, and it just keeps getting more and more exciting to see the things. So if you're exploring in a basin that has uh, a cliniform package, of infill above a major source rock. You need to look at all aspects of the cliniforms. That's, I think, a takeaway we all need to recognize. And as we talk about the traps, let's talk a little bit about the abundant, illuminated, and elusive stratigraphic traps. And of course, as we look at how super basins are related to giant fields, there are more giant fields in these super basins than anywhere else, because that's where the factors are right. But if you look at the attributes, as we talked about in uh, the comments about John Dolson's work and the Giant Fields database, that's part of the new memoir, we can make some observations. So that's what drove the observation that there were almost all structural traps in the Middle East made people realize that there probably are a lot of stratigraphic traps. We're just not exploring for them. So it's important to look at the attributes of these giant fields. Now, 
a few words about stratigraphic traps. They are, as, as we've said before, they are more abundant than ever because of our ability to image them. And they are both uh, turbidites, largely driven turbidites, and um, a, uh, and reefs. And there has been just a new exciting wave. So thank you, Mike, for telling us in the 70s to get get after it, that uh, to search for the subtle, uh, deliberately search for the subtle stratigraphic trap. Uh, we hear you. <laughs> It just took us a while to perfect the tools, but we are doing it as an industry. Now, analogs. I believe in the language of expiration, and prospects are sentences, plays are paragraphs, and basins are chapters, and the entire globe is the book of expiration. So we need to speak the language on various levels, and it's all about Immerse, immersion, experience, and comparing and contrasting. So that's why we do these programs. And so let's look at some fun examples. So this is the prototype super basin, onshore super basin. We've here's the key. Here's the 30 second elevator speech to what makes a super basin. Ready, go. <laughs> Thick, rich source rocks, preferably low in the section. Multiple source rocks is even better which the Permian Basin has, a thick pile of reservoirs infilling the basin, and a large impermeable regional seal and a relatively simple undisturbed tectonic that preserves the traps. Done. I think I did it in 29 seconds. <laughs> this is a key element and the proper burial and the proper timing. Yes, we have to get that right too. And maturation. But that's the key elements of a super basin. Oh, yes. And don't forget the late tilt. So as we look at that, we see the same thing in the fabulous West Siberian super basin, which, by the way, has multiple source rocks deep in the section, lots of reservoirs, a really fantastic regional seal, uh, relatively structurally undisturbed and, he undisturbed. and here's its outline. Oh, but wait, look at the scale. This is the Permian Basin by comparison. <laughs> it is a motif, but it the scales change and some of the details change. We, as we look at what can be learned, uh, here's some work by Bill Zagorski that he's we're going to have a super basin session at the eastern section uh, next week, and the we some of the key takeaways are. Uh, the importance of getting away from the deformation belt, where there's a lot of fractures and cores, to the less disturbed belt, um, where the Marcellus play is being made in the Appalachians. And we're working with uh, West Canada Sedimentary Basin. We've got a great team working on a paper for super basins, the lessons that will be learned from that. I love this example from our good friend Alfredo Guzman, who teamed up with um, Chris Cheatwood and took the an analog from the Permian Basin, the Sprayberry Trend, and compared it to a basin, Chicantepec Basin in Mexico. And what's amazing is the areas and layers layering is quite comparable uh, in many ways. The ages are different, but it doesn't matter because the analogs of the distribution of the resources is comparable. But the sprayberry trend, of course, has had a huge success because it has had a lot of capital. <laughs> and the Port Chicondovec Basin is an arrested basin because it is starved for capital, but it is waiting. It is waiting for us. It is waiting for explorers. And of course, there are many lessons to be learned as we look at subsalt and pre-salt. I love this uh, from Tom Ewing showing the deep source rocks again, uh, a great top seal in the pre-salt. And because of the salt, the ability to, re to transfer heat. And so what might have been thought to be an extra hot deep area actually is a little cooler because of the heat transfer. So it puts a lot more prospects 
in the oil window. This is something <laughs> of global significance as we estimate pre-salt around the world. And if you want to immerse, I have a couple friends who have told me they have gone and uh, they watch these videos that we have made part of the legacy from the Super Basins talks to uh, the DPA to um, Discovery Thinking. So the APG has a policy that you're not supposed to take uh, photos during slide presentation, but you have my permission to take this photo because I want you to have these links and I want to encourage you to use them. And some of my colleagues have said that they organize team luncheons where they sit around with their integrated multidiscipline team and they watch some of these videos that are relevant to get some analogs on either plays they're working on plays that are similar to what they're working so they can get some possible new ideas so this is there for you dear explorers so a couple words about economics and commercial mastery we spend as geoscientists we spend a lot of time working on technical mastery but as uh, bob frickland has pointed out and his friends at ihs to make these basins and plays work, we have to fit into the global community and we have to work in a commercial way because the commerce drives the technology. So a word or two about the environment. Here we are in Denver and a couple of my colleagues have pointed me in the direction of Chris Wright, who's very positive on the good things that are happening in our industry. And we're working on it, uh, and we need to keep working on it, it's true. But I would say this, that we live on one planet, one globe. <laughs> so what we, we're all in this together. So let me leave it at that. We all need to work together. So I want to make a comparison here. I think it's very important as we talk with our colleagues about energy in our public outreach that we talk about the good things and not just the bad things of hydrocarbons. Right now, it's a lot of focus on the bad things, but not enough of the good things. And I think that balance is fair. And we talk a lot of the good things about alternative energy but we don't talk about the full cost accounting, and we should. So a couple positive examples of working with communities. You can see some of these here, but in essence, I would sum this up as good geologists make good neighbors. Thank you, Wallace Pratt. So I would say on the final of the seven habits for creative energy geoscientists is the creative thinking, which I liken to the Covey sharpening the saw analogy. And this is about teams, workflows, operation. So we know the workflows for geoscientists when we're talking about conventional, unconventional plays is very short cycle. And there's a lot of feedback back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between feedback loops of information and work. In the offshore and in the deep water, multinational companies have these long cycle conventional exploration efforts, and you can see it can take a long time. And I would say for conventional exploration in the onshore with independence, it can be much more rapid. It's the rapid long cycle, but still it's a much longer cycle because there is a longer workflow. So to professional geoscientists, as you continue and plan your careers, I think it's important to have self-awareness about what your uh, passions are, what your strengths and skills, and are you happy in this environment, happy in this environment, happy in this environment, and most productive, and perhaps it's worth trying them all. Many, I wanna make a point about who does a lot of the operation. We, we love the majors and the multinationals, but at least in my experience going to places in the United States um, that 
there are a lot of independent companies. Perhaps 80% of all the activity is done by a lot of very small companies. And what's exciting about this from a creativity standpoint is that everyone is trying different things. So you get many shots on goal. As we look at the uh, roll up for or big companies and the numbers of super basins they're in, some of them are in uh, more than 10 super basins. Uh, independents are likely just in one, but they can be in a few depending on, but it's just you know a matter of resources. But for me, the conversation here is how do we transfer the best practices uh, among the uh, many basins and what role can APG play? And that for me is the niche that the Super Basin Initiative attempts to fill. I also wanna say that as we look at discovery thinking and creative thinking, that they're pyramids of, as uh, my colleague Bill Ferris likes to say, there's the taxonomy of learning domains. So there's, we all know from our own education, we can remember and understand, but as we become more critical and analytical, we look at the data and we start to see patterns and we start to see things. But the highest form is a break. It's a creative thinking. And my favorite example is that when you combine things, a lot of creative thinking, it's not creating something out of thin air that never existed, but it's often just taking things like horizontal drilling that existed for a long time and hydraulic fracturing that existed for a long time and combining them in a creative way to meet the needs. And as we work on data, we have, and I thank you, Dick Bishop, we have to, what connects us all these things towards wisdom is our experiences. And what I'd like to say is it's not just a pyramid. There's a fourth dimension here of our heritage. People who have come before us have provided a lot of foundation for us to build on their shoulders. And we thank them. And by the way, it's our obligation to build for others so that they may build upon our contributions. So that's it. Those are the seven habits of the creative, the toolkit, Super Basin toolkit. Here's the reference. If you wanna read greater details. So I'd like to end and summarize as follows. There are a lot of resources here on the APG webpage. But in summary, the best geologist has seen the most rocks. And you can see a lot of that information here on this APG webpage or the other ones I showed before. Sharing our heritage lifts us all. And the greatest source of energy is the energy within us. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you.